Welcome back to our Med Smarter Lecture Series, where we're taking a smarter approach to preparing future physicians. Before we get started, if you'll take just a quick minute and click that like button, and also subscribe and turn the bell on so that you'll be notified when we post new videos. This week we're going to talk about Clostridia. Clostridia in and of itself is a gram-positive organism, and it forms spores. You can see those spores here in this picture on the right side as these white uh, almost egg or seed like shapes. Uh, this is Clostridium botulinum here with crystal violet stain. Along with the, the fact that it forms spores, it is also an obligate anaerobe rod. So, being an obligate anaerobic rod means that it cannot be able to function in the presence of oxygen, so it has to undergo anaerobic respiration. Tetanus toxin and botulinum toxin, which are two forms of clostridia, are proteases here that cleave the snare proteins, and those snare proteins are what are involved in neurotransmission. So let's look further into specific types of clostridium. First, we will talk about clostridium tetani. Clostridium tetani is also known as tetanus, and it causes a tetanospasm. This is due to an exotoxin that causes, well, like I said, tetanus. Tetanospasm here actually blocks the release of GABA and glycine from the Renshaw cells in the spinal cord. So we are blocking GABA and glycine, which are inhibitory neurotransmitters. So we're blocking that, causing the spasm, so an unregulated contraction of the muscles there. You can see a picture here on the right, uh, and these almost look like tennis racket shapes here with their spores on them. That's the Clostridium tetani forming those spores, and the red is the spore there. So what are some symptoms of a Clostridium tetani infection? Well, we have that spastic paralysis. So you can think of spastic and tetanospasm is what is going on here. Uh, that spastic paralysis is your most classic form of uh, tetanus. We also see a trismus or lockjaw where their jaw is clenched and they can't move the jaw up and down. Rhizus sardonicus is a raised eyebrow um, or an open grin that is commonly seen with clostridium tetani. This word here is apostodinous, which is a spasm of the spinal extensors. So they will actually look like they're uh, extending their back pretty strongly. And then uh, it will also, it can be prevented by the tetanus vaccine. That's one factor here associated with tetanus. Uh, so if we have a tetanus vaccine that's active, that can prevent any type of infection with tetanus and the symptoms associated with it. We treat tetanus with antitoxin uh, as well as a vaccine booster. So uh, depending upon if uh, you are due for an, a vaccine, we can give a booster there, but we also have an antitoxin for tetanus. Uh, antibiotics for any potential infection uh, outside of the Clostridium tetani that could, could be seen here. For those muscle spasms that patients can undergo, we can use diazepam to help reduce those muscle spasms. And then any wounds that may have formed from the uh, inoculation of Clostridium tetani, uh, we'll go in and do a wound debridement and get rid of all any of the necrotic tissue there. So one way to help remember uh, tetanus here is that tetanus is a tetanic paralysis. Let's continue on talking about Clostridium botulinum. Clostridium botulinum is a heat label toxin that inhibits our acetylcholinesterase release at our neuromuscular junction. This is what gives us botulism. For adults, the disease is actually seen by ingesting that preformed toxin. However, with babies, babies can actually get it from ingesting spores that give us this disease. Um, this is what's called floppy baby syndrome. So where do these spores come from? Um, you can get them from bad uh, bottles of food, juice, but one of the most common ways that we see it, and you'll see this oftentimes tested, is with honey. All right, uh, Honey can have some botulinum spores inside of the honey, and this is why we do not give honey to infants less than one year of age because their body would not be able to handle the ingestion of that uh, of those spores. You see in this picture over here, this is a, a picture of a 14-year-old that has botulism. Uh, they're seeing common signs and symptoms here, which we'll talk about in a second, but that weakness of those eye muscles and the drooping eyelids is, um, is one of the main common signs and symptoms there. This one thing to note about this patient here, this patient was fully conscious when these photos were taken. Uh, he just had no ability 
to open his eyes uh, due to the botulism uh, infection there. So how do we treat it? First of all, we treat with human botulinum immunoglobulin. And before we treat it, we obviously need to find out what we're dealing with. So the symptoms associated with, with botulism is going to be the four Ds. All right? You have diplopia, dysarthria, dysphagia, and dyspnea. Diplopia, dysarthria, dysphagia, and dyspnea. Now, something interesting about clostridium botulinum is that we actually use this to treat things. Okay, um, One of the most common things that you're probably used to hearing uh, this being used for is cosmetic procedures, so Botox. Uh, so that is going to help us reduce wrinkles. It's going to inhibit acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction. That's going to decrease that uh, contraction of those muscles, so decreasing the potential for wrinkles to form. Uh, but we also use this for focal dystonia, hyperhidrosis, muscle spasms, and then like we've always said, Botox or the cosmetic reduction of wrinkles there. If you found this material helpful for your studying, please like and consider subscribing to the channel. Also, share this video so that more people can benefit from it like you have.